its final Agora session of this year's Abu Agora 2020 on the theme of water. My name is Ruth Ilman, and um, I'm the director of the Donner Institute for Research in Religion and Culture here in Obu. And uh, I'm also a scholar of Jewish studies and a keen swimmer. So I think all of you understand that presenting this particular Agora lecture at this particular Abu Agora on the theme of water is a dream coming true for me. Usually at this point, I say I'm so happy to see so many of you here. But this year, I will instead say, I'm so happy to see that you are so responsibly with us this year. Those of you attending here in Sibelius Museum, being very, very careful about um, keeping the distance, and most of you following us in Zoom. At this point, I also want to say a huge and heartfelt thank you to our coordinator, Lisa Lalu, to our trainee, Janika Grönroos, to all the student assistants and the staff of Sibelius Museum who have worked really, really hard to make this year's Abu Agora come true, even though we have all the restrictions of the virus. So thank you. The theme of this Agora lecture is Stormy Waters, Secrets Inherited, and the Creation of a Family. David Grossman in conversation with translator Natalie Lantz on his new novel. Now, David Grossman doesn't really need any introduction. I think all of you know him. He's one of the absolutely leading Israeli contemporary writers. He is the author of 11 internationally acclaimed novels, five works of nonfiction, short collections, children's books, children's operas, and plays. His works have been translated into 45 languages around the world. He has also um, a large societal involvement. He is a vocal left-wing peace activist in his native Israel, an engagement that was further spurred as his son Uri was killed in action in the Lebanon War of 2016, of which uh, Grossman wrote the novel Falling Out of Time. David Grossman has received numerous literary and peace prizes throughout the years. Among these, the latest one is the Man Booker International Prize in 2017 for his novel, Suzehad Niknas Le Bar, A Horse Walks Into the Bar. This book is in Swedish called En Hest Går in Poen Bar. And that Swedish translation has been um, accomplished by Natalie Lantz who is uh, David's discussion partner here in Abu Agora today. Natalie Lantz is a translator of contemporary Hebrew prose, poetry, and other creative works. She has translated David Grossman and also works by Amos Otz and Dan Pagis, to mention a few. She also writes columns specifically focusing on, on Jewish culture in uh, Swedish newspapers such as Expressen, Judith Kronika, Access and Response. Um, and most importantly, maybe, I know her in the capacity of a doctoral candidate in Hebrew Bible at Uppsala University, where she is working with a doctoral dissertation on Hebrew texts. That's also in the capacity that she has visited Obo Academy previously. So today, David Grossman and Natalie Lantz will we will share with you a conversation on Grossman's newest novel, Iti Chachaim Mesachek Harbe, Medmele Kalivet, Life Plays With Me, which was published in Swedish in Natalie's translation only last week. This book explores the awful power of secrets and wounds passed from one generation to the next. The story revolves around three women, Vera, her daughter Nina, and her granddaughter, Gili. A bitter secret pits them against each other for decades, leading them finally to embark on an odyssey over stormy waters to Goli Otok, the naked island of the, off the coast of Croatia. There, 
Vera had been imprisoned, enslaved, and tortured for three years, having refused to betray her husband and denounce him as an enemy of the people. This book is based on a true story, but it also uses imagination to a large extent. And uh, we will first now follow the conversation that has been pre-recorded. And um, I had the chance to listen in to the recording of this talk last week. As it, the discussion moved over the axis, Jerusalem, Obu, Gotland. And I can only say now, savior the moment, you have a wonderful hour ahead of you. So the lecture is pre-recorded. After that, we will zoom in our two panelists, Grossman and Lantz, for a live Q&A. And for all of you following us in Zoom, please write your questions in the chat in Zoom, and we will post them here during the live Q&A. So please welcome David Gross and Natalie Lantz. Shalom, David. Shalom, Natalie. Good to see you and to hear you. Good to see you. It's been almost exactly a year since we met in person last summer. And uh, things have happened. The world is very different. So I would, I would like to start with our last meeting. Because last summer we met you and I and some other of your translators. We traveled together uh, to Croatia to work together on, your, uh, on our translation of your new novel. And there is the picture of us standing in a central square in the city of Sisak. Uh, let's see if I can find it here and show the audience. There we have it, I think. Oh, I saw, ah, here we are. Here we are. So it's you and I and your translators, and it's after we're having a glass of wine after a hard day's work. Um, How happy we look. <laughs> today we wouldn't have been able to travel that freely. So I want to start this conversation with asking you how you are during these strange times and how has your work and life been affected by the coronavirus? They have been affected and uh, it's quite a depressing period, I must say. Uh, I think uh, every one of us feels that with every passing day we are losing something or we are deprived of some quality of our pr uh, previous quality of life. Uh, we are deprived from the, the, the privileged just to sit in a cafe without fear, just to walk without the masks, just to watch a show or to join a wedding. Uh, I think that this constant deprivation, step by step, and on top of it, you know, people are remoting from each other. They cannot see each other as they would have loved to. They cannot touch, they, they cannot hug or kiss. And I think many of us suddenly start to think of people with whom we worked all our life and it looked like the, they look like the most important people of our life and suddenly after such a remote period then nothing is taken for granted as before uh, so it is a very strange period i i thought in order to just to cheer myself up that in this period I'm going to write only children books, books for children at the age of three or four, and to read only books that are older than me. Uh, to write for children because it helped my optimism. And to, write, to read older than me writers is to keep my sobriety. So this combination is quite balancing and, and it's good for me. Yes, so it might be a general advice then to write children books and then read books that are older than we are. I'm happy to hear that you are okay during the, the circumstances. And I want to linger a little bit because um, in March um, this year, 
you wrote an article, a reflection on the coronavirus in the newspaper Haaretz. The text was translated to English and later to Swedish, so many people read that piece by you. And you refer to the virus as a disaster of biblical scale, but uh, you also wrote about the plague as a formative event from which new possibilities will emerge. And I'd like to quote you. In paralyzing times like these, the imagination is like an anchor that we cast from the depths of despair into the future, which we then start to pull ourselves towards. So it's been five months since you wrote this piece, and I wonder, at this stage, what are your reflections on, on the coronavirus uh, right now and the ripple effects of it? Well, I think I would like to, to answer from the point of view of the imagination, which is the most relevant for me. Uh, in such times, the imagination can work very strongly in both ways. On the negative way, because people with strong imagination, like myself, unfortunately, they can uh, create all kinds of nightmares to produce nightmares and possible disasters uh, in uh, intensity that almost can match the intensity of the virus itself. But the imagination can serve us also for good purposes and creative purposes in the sense that if we allow ourselves to think of how life might be after the corona, after this catastrophe is over, uh, if we are able to portray to ourselves the everyday life and the things that we miss and the things we are deprived of, then in a way we, we prove ourselves that we have not been totally confiscated by the situation. We have not been crushed totally by, by the corona and that we, in a way, we keep inside ourselves a kind of a bubble of, of imagination of how things can happen and hopefully would, will happen uh, in, in the future. Uh, but I also wrote about all kinds of things, symptoms of the virus, not only health symptoms, but for example, people who, after the, the shock and the crisis that they are going to go through in their life, they must, might ask themselves some questions regarding the work they are working and maybe they hate it, they feel suffocated in it. Maybe some people will think about their married life and ask themselves, is this the, the pattern they want to follow? Uh, all kinds of questions, even political questions after being confronted with the fragility of uh, life and touching the infrastructure of our being Maybe some people will change their political views. Maybe they will become less uh, conflictual. Maybe they will try to walk the other way, the more uh, peaceful way, the more dialogical way. Uh, the, the many things can change, you know, and not only for the worse. Now, I know it sounds like a kind of a naive illusion, but it is more in the, in the scale of a wishful thinking that might realize itself. I think of the, the song of John Lennon, Imagine. Yes, imagine there are, there are no countries, no borders, no religions too. Uh, so it did not mean that uh, Lennon thought that it's going to happen tomorrow. And I think that there is something important in just keeping this tunnel between us and a better future open, that we remember that okay, now we are victims of this plague, but still if we maintain some qualities and some active optimism, uh, we might come out of this crisis a little better. Thank you. I wanna move to another drama of biblical scale now, David, namely your new novel. <laughs> <laughs> And in the Swedish translation, that is just now published, Memelekelivet. And I suppose, as this book was just fresh from the press, that not so many people in the audience that are watching this right now have, have had time to read it yet. But it's out there in Swedish. And um, the, the novel 
explores the awful power of secrets and rules that are passed from one generation to the next. And it revolves around the three women, Vera, her daughter Nina, and her granddaughter Gili. And uh, Vera's character actually evolved from a true life story that you were told by your friend Eva Panich Nahir. Um, and uh, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about the creation story behind this book. Uh, one day the phone rang and there was this lady on the other side of the line and she had a voice like our legendary Prime Minister David Ben-Gurion and she said, David, you know, immediately I went upright. I was sure I did something wrong, but there was some scolding in her voice. Uh, and she turned to be a very nice lady, uh, Eva Panich Nahir, and she, she wanted to remark, to make a remark about something I wrote uh, on that day in one of our papers, and she had some reservations from it, and from here to there we started to speak, and I immediately felt that she is a very, very unique human being. Now, Natalie, you know that every human being is unique, but she was unique in a uniquer way. Uh, she was a combination of toughness and softness uh, and of almost fanaticism when it came to her political views. She was a very devoted communist and later socialist, uh, but at the same time, the sweetest and the softest person and the most empathetic person and above all, she had this life story that I never heard uh, something like that before. And believe me, Natalie, being a writer makes me an address for all kinds of human stories. People come and give me their stories, which is a wonderful thing. Not all of them I can write. Actually, almost all of them I cannot write because I prefer to write something that comes only from myself and that I have Im imagined it. But in this case, her a story touched something in me, something very deep and relevant in myself, and I felt that I want to write her story. Now, you have to, uh, to remember, she did not give me her story in one take. She called me one day and gave me some parts of it, and then some weeks later, other parts of it. And she knew how to lure me, how to, to uh, uh, attract me to her story. And all the time she was checking if I'm going to write this story uh, in sometime in the future. She very much wanted it. And I said, look, Eva, her name is Eva, as I said in life, even though I mix them now between Eva and Vera. Look, Eva, uh, I will write your story because I feel it's, it's burning in me. And I know the feeling, I know when I will write a story, when I'm going to write a story. But you have to remember, I'm not a documentarist. I will not write you as you are in your life one-to-one. -one. I'm a fiction writer and, and I have to invent you in a way or to imagine you and to fantasize you if I really want to write you. Everything that I will imagine or fantasize or add to you could have happened to you, could have been yourself. I will not impose on you something that totally I feel do not belong to you. But you have to be aware that you will see yourself from a point of view that is not always flattering, that sometimes is conflictual, because the, 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 the story that she gave me left a lot of place for conflict and disagreements and even rage about her, about something she did when she was young, when she was a mother to a young girl of six and a half years. Uh, and, and you have to, to accept it, and she immediately accepted. And she said, you are an artist. I cannot tell you what to do. I cannot censor you. You will write whatever you want, uh, but just hurry, she said. And unfortunately, I did not hurry enough. And she died before I finished uh, the book. She died. We, we were friends for, I think, 20 or 25 years even. Uh, and she died when she was 97, five years ago. And uh, I really miss her in my life. And I miss our conversations and our disagreements. Uh, and I must say, it was a very strong experience writing her story, being loyal to her, and at the same time, betray her in, in, in the places that maybe she did not want to know about herself. 
that thing that we do when when you explain it as uh, when the story starts burning within you and you just have to pursue it you just have to write it but then on the other hand imagining uh, a story behind which there is an actual destiny a voice and a narrative as a writer what is most challenging about that to you to recognize the the nucleus of, of her being, of her character, and to remain loyal to it, even if it has not happened in, in real life, to remain loyal to it and to, to touch, to be in contact all the time with this nuclear of, nucleus, sorry, of authenticity. Uh, and and if, you are do, if you are writing in that way, and I was, I had this experience of writing about real people, real human beings, uh, in the past, always asking for their permission. Uh, and, and I think that even if I felt while writing that it might be painful for them to read the book later, I felt that I'm doing something right. And I must say that in all cases, they felt that they have been enhanced, enhanced in, in a way. Uh, I always think there is memory that I had when I was writing the book of intimate grammar. I don't know how it's called in Swedish and Finnish. And it's about a small family in Jerusalem, very symbiotic family, Jerusalem of the 60s, like my own family, my parents, my brother, me. And the, all the time of my writing, I felt horrible of how can I do it to them? How can I be with them and love them? And at the same time, write harsh things about them. And the book came out, and this is the book that uh, my parents love the most of all my books. And I think, and they recognize themselves in it, and it, it changes things uh, within them. And, and it's, it's so funny that when I first gave it to my father to read, uh, before the book was published, I thought it's fair that he will read and make his remarks and wish I will change things if he wants me to change. And he read the book and he said, well, it's a very nice book, David, but do you really think that someone out of our family will be able to understand it? And I thought, how sweet it is of him. And I thought, this is, this is the reaction I want to have for my books, you know, that they will be translated to Finnish and to Chinese and to Albanian, and that my father will always think, is this book understandable by someone out of our family? Um, so that thing, David, because like much of your work, this book also um, deals with the family's inherited secrets and wounds, but also it explores the, the healing power and the very uh, making, the genesis of a family. Um, and I've been thinking about that when, when looking in my library at your books. Why is the family so often the cosmos in which your stories unfold. Uh, yes, uh, I think that family is the greatest uh, drama of humanity. And it doesn't matter what kind of family. And today there are so many forms and shapes and structures of families. But the, the, the situation of some people living together, some of some of them are made of the materials, so to say, of others. And they are resembling others and they are different from each other. But in every phase, they are tied to each other and they radiate something towards each other. And, and I, I always think that the greatest moments and the most significant moments in humanity, they have occurred not in palaces of kings and queens and not in corridors of parliament and not on battlefields but in kitchens and in children rooms and in bedrooms the most deep and meaningful conversations the things that really touch me happen there and and i i think you know i think the book that tells the most about families and about the multi-layeredness of them that every word, every sentence can echo in lower and lower, deeper and deeper layer of this family. This book is the Bible. If you read the book of Genesis, you know, the intensity of the families there and the, 
the emotionality and the voltage of the emotions and the way people treat each other and the way they touch all human capacity, all human nuances that, that are possible. No wonder why this book is being read for thousands of years and the more you dig to it, the more you understand about us, about us today, about human beings. And I'm, I'm saying it as a secular, I'm an out and out secularist, I'm a non-believer. It's even important for me to be a non-believer. But every week, for example, in the last 30 years, me and another friend, uh, male and a female friends, and we are reading the Bible as Jews used to do throughout the generations with magnifying glass. And we read every sentence and we think of it and we bring our associations. Uh, and it can be from the Mishnah or the Talmud or from the last game of the NBA. Everything can, can be concluded in, included in that. Uh, and, and as I said, I'm not religious, but it tells me this. The Bible tells me so much about the psychology of mankind and about the way the Jewish people is shaped and how things that happened, you know, 4,000 years ago between Jacob and Lavan, his father-in-law, how they still show themselves in our reality today as a people in our politics. I didn't know that you actually had a um, Bible study group, uh, Chavruta. That's wonderful to hear. That's wonderful to hear, David. Um, I want to go back a little bit to the story of Vera and the story that originated from, from Eva, your friend. Um, I'm going to show a picture of you standing at the prison, the creation prison island, Goli Otok. Um, let's see. So, can you, um, oh, I have to say also that all these uh, photos that I show during our conversation comes from the film crew of Alma Films, which is a, um, an Israeli film team that actually followed us, you and all of the translators, to Croatia, and they are now working on a film about your work and about our work together and about your um, your, your journey to Goli Otok. So, can you tell me a little bit about the core drama of Invira's life? What happened to her uh, at Goli Otok? Well, it's hard to tell this story without spoiling some things, but, well, anyhow, it's not a detective story, so I can make a spoiler. Uh, Invira was a Jewish a girl born to a Jewish family in uh, the city of Chakovets in Croatia, former Yugoslavia. Uh, when she was uh, 17, going 18, she met uh, Rade Panic, a non-Jewish uh, officer in the office in the, in the army of Tito. They fell in love, and when I say they fell in love, try to imagine two people really falling in love, you know, actively, physically. They, they, they had such a total hermetic love that hardly left a place for anyone else. They had a daughter, her name in real life is Tiana. In my book, she is Nina. And uh, they, were, they fought with the partisans against the Nazis. They were very devoted Yugoslavians. Yet, one day the husband was accused of Triazon of uh, trying to prepare the ground for a Russian invasion. It was in 1948 when Stalin considered invading into Yugoslavia and Tito stood in front of him. And Tito, cre Tito created uh, some islands of rehabilitation that actually became like islands of ex extermination because thousands of people died there. Uh, Rade Panic, the man, uh, was interrogated by the Secret Service of Tito, and during his interrogation, he committed suicide. And Eva, Vera, was sent to the island of Goli Otok. Uh, and she spent there three years. And you see that I'm skipping the most important information because I really don't want people uh, to be disappointed or to, I, I want them to read the book uh, Tabula Rasa as possible. 
but I can say that she was on this horrible place, Goli Otok, for almost three years. And the, the place was not as it is today. There were no buildings or structures, only barracks. There was no vegetation on this island. This is why it's called Goli Otok, the naked uh, island. And she has been tormented physically daily there and humiliated, then hit. And for example, one of the punishments that almost every woman in this women camp had to do is to, to roll a rock against the slope of the hill. And she was a very small lady, very tiny. And I asked her, how did you do it? How were you able to move a rock? Because when I went on the island years later, I tried to move a rock, it was impossible. And she told me that she had a, a, a method, a way of thinking. She told herself that her daughter who was left behind her in, in, uh, in Belgrade, that her daughter, Tiana, needs a medication. And up the hill, there is the pharmacy. So Eva had to roll the stone until the pharmacy. And she got there at the last moment before the pharmacy was closed down, the imaginary pharmacy. And there was a lady who immediately gave her the medication and then Eva had to roll down the, the rock, down the slope of the hill, being careful not to be crushed by it because people had been crushed by it. And she got all the way down, she got to Tiana and she gave her the medication and immediately she started to roll back because Tiana needs a medication and up here, uh, uphill there is the pharmacy and the medication. And so she did 12 hours a day for some months. And she was one of the very few of the people who came out from Goli Otok without betraying her friends, without telling on her friends, without giving away all kind of secrets if she had secrets. And I, I spent twice I was on this island while writing it. It's a horrible place. It is really a place that you feel the, the quality of the, of the things that have been done here. You feel it almost physically. It is ugly as only sheer violence can be ugly. And, and uh, I tell you frankly, I don't know if I was able, would have been able to survive there for one day. Uh, in the story, uh, these um, rocks that Vera has to roll are, um, they're, they're playing a quite important part also. And the physical and mental strength that she builds up and, and maintains in her life. Um, and I remember because all of us, uh, you and, and the translators, we were going to go together to Goliotok, but um, it's also, it's, it's a dangerous journey. Um, it's stormy and uh, it's easy to fall. So in the end, we didn't make the trip. But watching the picture is uh, really emotional for everyone who has been, been dealing with your book and with the story of Eva and, and Vera. And speaking of, of uh, that, the, um, the book also deals with uh, the plot takes place mostly in uh, former Yugoslavia. So how did it feel for you to uh, at least partly leave the Israeli scenery and drama? It's not usual for me uh, to leave uh, the Israel scenery. Uh, I know Israel, I was born here. I, I feel it's the only place that I can decode, that I understand why people are doing what they are doing. And even the bad things I feel they are doing, I, I am made of their materials. They are relevant for me and here, here I am and probably I'll, I hope I will stay here. Uh, but the story took place in another place and I followed it, of course. And I, I felt that I, I can understand also what happens there, not in terms of details, but I, in, in all my books, I'm attracted to write about arbitrariness, about how an individual is facing an outer arbitrariness. Uh, I wrote about the arbitrariness of the Nazi thought and the Nazi regime. I wrote about the arbitrariness that our body, our physical dimension has upon our soul, mental dimension and vice versa. How we become prisoners of uh, one obsession. 
psychological obsession. I wrote a book about jealousy, about a man who is so jealous for his wife that he invents a lover for her so he will be able to be jealous uh, on her. Uh, I wrote about the arbitrariness of, uh, of military occupation, like the occupation Israel has in the West Bank uh, for 53 years. Uh, and of course, I wrote uh, books about the absolute total arbitrariness, which is death, about how do we live with death? How, how do we live with totality? Uh, and, and how we bear the pain of living, of, of experiencing death of someone who is precious to us. Uh, and and I, I was attracted to this topic, I think from the very beginning of, of me, my career, so to say, in American. Uh, uh, because I felt that when an individual faces this arbitrariness, this monolithical wall of arbitrariness, still you can really do something to change this situation, to change your helplessness. Even by the, the very fact that you are describing this arbitrariness, somehow is changed in the whole situation between you and the arbitrariness. Suddenly, you are not a totally passive, helpless victim of this arbitrariness. Just by writing, by describing, by giving nuances to something that before you started writing about it was totally untouchable and unchangeable. So it's not that if I write about death, death will stop. No, I'm sorry to say it won't work. Also, the, the military occupation that we have on the Palestinians will not stop very soon, I'm afraid. And all the other arbitrarinesses will not really be changed. But something in the inner position that I have in front of them makes me able to move more freely in front of what has paralyzed me before. And I, I, I think all my writing is about moving. All my writing is about that there are people who are moving, running, jogging, swimming, driving, flying. I need this quality of not being nailed to a certain thing, to a certain reality, to certain ideas. Uh, and, and here, when I came to, to the story of Eva Panich Nahir, I immediately recognized something I know and something I want to be in touch with. And this is the way how she faced our, the totalitarian arbitrariness of the regime, how she kept her, not only her humanity, but even her dignity. Because it's so easy to lose one's dignity in, in such condition. And she kept her dignity. Uh, and, and I, well, yes, that, that was what I can say about it. Was it that, um, that grain, that essence in her story that made it burn inside of you, you think? Her dealing with the arbitrariness of, of her situation? Yes, yes. As, as I've said, I recognize something familiar. And I recognized a person who actually was in such situation, not only as a metaphor. She really faced all the dark, the black machinery of the Yugoslavian secret service, for example. All the machinery of the uh, tormenting. All the machinery of, of prison, who was one of the most cruel prisons on earth. I tell you, people who came to Goli Otok after they have been during the Second World War, during the Shoah, they have been in Auschwitz. They said that in Goli Otok, it was worse. Because in Auschwitz, you always knew who are the good guys and who are the bad guys. And here in Goli Otok, it was planned in such a way that every person could be your enemy. Even if you gave someone a slice of bread to save her when she was about to starve or to die, if she went and told about you to the commander, you who gave her the bread, you would be punished severely and she would be upgraded in the way to the chance to be released from this island. So it's, it's like hell. It is a place like hell. And in this place, my Vera, this, I, I'll try to describe it in a very delicate way, she found a way to be humane. She found a way to bring life to something, to protect something from evil, uh, to infuse good into something. And she knew, and this is, I think, a rare and very deep feeling. She knew that 
Maybe she's the only one in all this camp with all the hundreds of women, the only one who is able to explore good with capital G. And, and this feeling of doing good, of finding in yourself the power to do good, not to collaborate with the total despair of the situation, this maybe saved her. Um, I want to ask you, Una, about another thing that has to do with arbitrariness and, and moving of an individual. Um, you spoke also about the bodily realities that everyone has to face. And uh, often in your stories, I've um, come across that you always, uh, not always, but, but a theme is that you um, describe the person's uh, physical appearance. Dovale from Susichad, from En Heskorin Klembar, a horse walks into a bar. He's very short, and uh, that is an important thing in the book. He's very short. He's just, uh, I think, two centimeters taller than I am. I think he's one meter 57. Um, Vera is short, and Vera's granddaughter, a Gili, is very tall, and she's struggling with this. She's struggling with her uh, womanhood. Um, and the story is woven together by these voices of these three women. And the bodily experience of all of them are um, central in the story. It's uh, adolescence, sex, childbirth, nursing, and aging. So I want to ask you, how, is it, how was it to write about these experiences in the voices of, of women? Well, first, how is it to write from the voices of any other other? And, and you, are, you are right, Natalie. I, I love not love, I, I have to write also about the physical uh, being of every character. I, I mean, we talk about the themes uh, in my book. I'm not a theme writer, I'm a storyteller, basically. And in order to understand my characters, I first must understand them and know them physically. I really have to know them physically uh, and how they walk and how they talk and how they make love and if they move their hands and how curly is their hair. All this, I, this is my way to, to become them. Uh, and I, I remember when, when I was writing someone to run with, I don't know the name in Swedish. Uh, okay, uh, but uh, the, the main character, the main heroine is, is a young woman at the age of 16. Amar, her name is. And for some months I struggled with her because I was unable to really know her. And then one day I entered a, a shop of computer equipment in our mall, in our little suburb of Jerusalem. And suddenly there was a young girl standing next to the, the, the person who sells the things. And she was waiting for her cue to come. And I saw her from, from here. You see, you see my hand like that, as if the camera is here. I saw only this part of her. And she had, this part was very strong and very tender and sweet at the same time. And suddenly I got her, I realized how she should look and she wore a kind of a worn out jeans. And I just knew this is my Tamara. And I remember I flew out of the shop before I will hear her voice because her voice I took from another young lady and I, I, I didn't want to, to mix it with what this girl might make me here. So only when I had her physically, I understood her, I knew her, I was able to, to write her. And this is the case with every character I write, because I think the key, our body and other people's body, is such a strong key to our personality. And, and so many of us suffer deeply before, because of their bodies. And, and as if the, the, the mankind is the only species on earth that did not finish the process of adjusting to his body or her body. And then so much of the sorrow of people has to do with, with some redundant or needless uh, distortions or not distortions, I don't want to judge it, but modification of their body and their wish to be different bodily. And, and of course, when I wrote uh, To the End of the Land, uh, I, the main character there was Ora. And I, I, 
again, did not have her physically until in the end, I think after four years or so, I suddenly understood her body uh, and I knew her. I knew her even in the, the, the biblical sense of it, you know, in the book of Genesis, it's written, and Adam knew his wife Eve. By the way, it's not written that he understood his wife Eve, he knew her. Uh, and, and I think the best way for, the most essential way of a writer is to know the characters you write about. And with her, with the, uh, oh, I had really a funny, a funny relationship because I was writing her for two, almost three years. And I was, as I said, I was unable to know her. And I was so desperate because I felt I'm losing the book. I will not have this book. So out of despair, I just sat down and wrote her a letter with a, with a pen, with a page, not a mail in the computer. And I wrote her a letter, dear Ora, I said, why are you like that? Why, you, why do you behave like that? Why are you so stubborn? Why don't you surrender to me? And the moment I wrote these words, I understood how stupid I was to think that she has to surrender to me. It is me who must surrender to the option of Ora inside me. And, and when I understood that, suddenly I felt her. Physically, I felt her. I, I understood what does it mean to be in the body of Ora. And, and I think this is one of the, the real joys of writing because we are populated by so many options of life, of body, of way of thinking, of sense of humor. But over the years, we, we tend to entrench and to narrow down ourselves to only one. We have one body, we have one uh, sense of humor, one worldview. Most of us speak one or at the most two languages, which means that our world is being formulated in a very narrow way. Uh, we are one and it helps to, of course, to function when you are one. You need it, otherwise you will spread out to all possible options and you will not live normal life. But when you are an artist, when you are a writer, you want to spread out to all options and you want to know what does it mean to be a baby, to be a woman, to be a very old man, to be the head of an extermination camp like in Sea Under Love, to be a dog, to be a cat, to be all the options are available to us if we stop fighting them, if we are, are losing our entrenched fists and, and allow ourselves just to be all the diversity, all the wealth that, that the world suggests us. Not always it is easy, I tell you frankly. And, and for a male writer to write a female a character is even harder. You have to give up of a lot of inhibitions, a lot of even shyness or embarrassment. But it so much pays off when you allow yourself to, to become this other, when you suddenly look at reality from the point of view, the deep point of view, the constitution point of view of, of the other. Uh, and suddenly reality seems so different from you and for you. And, and, you know, even I recommend it politically. You know, if I think of the conflict between us and our neighbors, the Palestinians, if only we were able to change points of look at each other, it doesn't mean to give up on our justice, on our suffering, on our story. It just means that we make our contact with the world, with reality, with our conflict, richer and more multi-layered. We shall not yield to the story of the Palestinians, but we might infiltrate their story and their misery and their justice into our very entrenched uh, systems. Uh, and, and I think this is the first step always to reconciliation, that you are willing to infiltrate parts of the story of your enemy into your own official story. And you see that you do not collapse before because of that. And you are not losing all the way, not at all. You are just in more touch with reality. And reality, it is not your wishful thinking and not your nightmares. Um. When I think about your um, authorship, because I've uh, partaken in, in these translation workshops with you that we will speak about a little later, but 
sometimes I think about you as an actor uh, more than a writer and, and connected to what you just said about infiltrating uh, the other, the, the bodily experiences and, and the views of the other. Uh, because you actually play out the characters. When you read to us translators, you, you rise from the chair, you spit and you scream and you, and you imitate the voices of... Um, you told us in the beginning that uh, Eva had the voice of uh, ben, ben Gurion. And I hear that voice in my head when I sat and translate because you read it that way to us. You read it with the voice of, um, of Vera, of Eva. Um, so it is amazing how you are very sort of physically invested in, in the characters as well. And if, if we linger on, on that subject a little bit longer, because another recurring perspective in your work um, is the gaze of the child. Uh, you often put the perspective of a child and let it shine through the adult uh, human being. and and. I, I wonder how it is to write with the gaze of a child and why that perspective is your, so prominent in your work. It's prominent because it's such a meaningful period in our life. I mean, if I knew I'm going to live 300 years, I would have dedicated at least 100 to childhood. But life is outrageously short, so I have to move up and to mature. But still, for example, in every person I see, I try to isolate the face of the child that he or she were. Mm -hmm. Now, when I'm growing up and aging, I'm looking also for the old men or women they will become. Mm -hmm. Present company excluded, of course. We will always be <laughs> uh, But uh, I think children have this privilege even to see the world unformulated. And therefore, it is richer. I remember, you know, we we have we had three children. We lost Uwe in the war. Uh, but I remember every time one of them said the first word, which in Hebrew usually one of the most popular first words is either mama or papa, ima or abba, or light. Or or is light. And I remember these three moments when my children said, oh, you know, they looked up and they pointed and they said, oh, light. And, and I was so happy. You know, everyone is happy when it happens because it means that the child is okay and develops well according to the books, is very obedient to the books. And then I felt also a kind of a slight touch of sorrow because who knows how many kinds of light my child has lost at that moment when he imprisoned all the thousands of different lights that exist in every normal average room or face. Uh, and and the, the wish when I write about a child is to get back to this place that is on the border of being formulated and on the border of being non-formulated. Um, and and uh, You, you said before, you, you said that I, that I was like an actor. Yes, I, first of all, I was a radio actor. From the age of nine, I was a radio actor in the Voice of Israel. I very much like acting. But here, when you write a book, you cannot uh, satisfy uh, the need by only being an actor. You have to be a whole theater. You, know, you have to play different actors, <laughs> which is not easy. Uh, and you have to be them. Uh, totally, uh, and and uh, as I said before, the physicality is so important in the story. Like, for example, the musicality, and this is why I liked very much this gathering of the translators that you mentioned. It was the third time I did it, and I think I'll do it with any new book, at least with books that have some translation challenges, uh, because. And maybe I'll just explain to our spectators how it works. We sit in near a round table and I sit somewhere in near this table. And ah, here you bring the picture. Good. Ah, this is how it looked like. Ah, my heart floods with longing to this period. Yeah. Uh, 
And I, I read to the translators uh, some paragraphs or a page or a chapter, and then I pause. I read in Hebrew. You all speak and write and read Hebrew. You are translators. Uh, and then there is silence. And then you start, you, the translators, start to consult with each other. And you start to give advice to each other about all kind of problems of translation. And the most important thing is that you hear the writer reading his book, which means that what, what is important for me that you will hear the melody of, of the story, the way or what I have heard in my inner ear while I was writing uh, this story. Uh, and, and I think so much of literature is music. And uh, you, you might miss a paragraph or even the whole book if you do not read it in the right melody. And when I read it to you, the translators, I also get the echo, echoes of how does it sound. And it also helps me sometimes to, to tune a sentence or to correct or to drop a sentence that appeared in the Hebrew version of it. Uh, so the versions after our gathering is all in Hebrew. The version in Hebrew after our gathering in Croatia or in Germany or wherever we met is much better and, mu and more nuanced. Um, the, uh, I think I described these meetings as uh, spiritual adventure because we really live inside of the novel for a whole week and it's extremely intense. You read out loud from early morning to late night and uh, we're always together during this week. So after a while I've noticed and other my colleagues have also noticed that we start speaking with the jargon of the characters almost. So it's, it's like walking into the, the novel. And I want to ask you uh, about this melody, because when you tour the world with your books, you almost uh, always insist on reading a, a bit out loud in Hebrew, even though the audience don't know, understand a word of it. Uh, and, and you want to fill the room, you have said before, with the nigun, with the melody of Hebrew. So I was wondering, what does reading and, and writing in Hebrew mean to you? It means a lot, of course. Uh, it's, it's the language I was born to, and it's the language that I can speak the most. I, don't, I know only English and Arabic, but you cannot compare uh, the familiarity I have with the Hebrew and, and with other languages. Uh, and I, it gives me kind of a small pride to belong to this long chain of writers in Hebrew or thinkers in Hebrew. Uh, I told you I'm reading the Bible every week and I, it enriches so much my Hebrew language. Uh, and I, I think, you know, this language goes back for almost 4,000 years. So it means that if Abraham, the patriarch, Abraham Avinu, was to sit with us to the dinner table, he would be able to understand at least half of the conversation of my eight and five years old granddaughters, uh, which is, it's amazing. It's amazing because the language contains so much residue, so much history and memory and identity and, and so much words, so many words in Hebrew and structures of uh, the everyday talk are taken from the Bible. Not always the person who speaks it recognizes exactly where it was taken for, where is the quotation from, but, but the Hebrew, the biblical Hebrew is still present in the most updated slang in Israel. So I do feel it is a privilege to, to be able to write in this language, even though the people who are able to read the Hebrew uh, modern fiction, well, there are not so many, maybe one million people. That's why translation is so meaningful to me. Uh, and that's why it's so important for me to have good translators like yourself, Natalie. And this is a good opportunity for me to thank you for your work and seriousness. And I was 
amazed to see my book with your remarks. I never saw something like that. Do you, do you have the book here? Yes, I do, I do. I have a very refined uh, system of uh, coloring wow. um, and making little notes to myself. <laughs> and it's, uh, it, it's, it's really a system. I worked it out um, years ago. So um, yes, I, I worked very hard with these uh, pedagogic notes that I have. As if you wrote my book, again, <laughs> you rewrote my book. You should deserve royalties. <laughs> We should tell that to my publishing house. Uh, speaking of which, when you were in Stockholm last time, 2017, to speak about your last novel, Susichad Michnas Lebach, and Hestgurim von Bar, after your appearance at this fancy literary event, you and I and a few people from the publishing house went out together to have dinner. And the morning after, you were flying to Svalbard, in order to make an interview with the literary talk show Babel. And I remember as the desserts came in, it was a late night, that us Scandinavians around the table, we tried to scare you with these ghastly stories of dangerous ice bears and the darkness of Svalbard. And I was so surprised when the dangerous ice bears and this Arctic darkness actually appear in your new novel. So I want to know, what happened to you on Svalbard? Well, I was taken by this place, by the, the aridity and the toughness of the hills around the little village of Svalbard. You noticed my accent. Uh, uh, and, and there's something so tough and so non-verbal about this place that I knew immediately after the, the show was uh, taken, the bubble show, that I will come back again alone and be there alone for some days. And, and I was there. And yes, I was scared because of the icebergs. There are 3,000 icebergs, uh, polar bears, in the hills around the little village of Svalbard. And you are not allowed to go out of the village without a gun or without a person who accompanies you and he or she knows how to use this gun. Uh, and uh, I, I spent there the days and the nights, it was half day, half night, the light was not clear, and the people I met, they were very hospitable, yet not all of them wanted to tell me why they are there, which gives it an air of mystery. And I remember every night before I went to sleep, there is a hotel there, I went to the pub of the village. Now, there are at least two pubs there. One declares itself to be the best pub in the world, and the other declares itself to be the best pub in Svalbard. You can guess where I went. I went to the, the best Svalbard pub. But then, at a certain point, after I drank and after I sang, because there are people coming there, you see how, how it's attracting people, because there, there's, there's so much fear outside. And it's so empty and so really frightening, I must say. And uh, there are people there from the, the coal mine, the last coal mine in Scandinavia, I think, is there. All the others have been shut down because of all kinds of pollution pro problems. But this uh, coal mine serves the people of the island. So the miners came to the uh, pub and uh, there were also the people from the satellite station that exists there in Svalbard. And these two met and they met and, and, and were able to collaborate through songs and they sang together. And then around midnight, I felt I want to go to sleep and I started to walk from the pub to my hotel. Now it's something like, what, 750 meters. And I walked alone without anyone carrying a gun and without carrying a gun myself. And I, as if, felt Nina, the, the daughter of Vera, Eva, in my book, I felt how it is to feel that you are going to be devoured. This is what she wants. She wants to be devoured, eaten, really, by someone who is totally irrelevant to her life. She wanted to assimilate into nothingness. 
She wants to be in a place that nobody knows her, not even the one who kills her. And you know, Natalie, when I walked there, I could have felt in my back the, the clothes of the bear. I, I was never so terrified. And I, I was here and there in some dangerous places. I war, was at wars. I, I went through things, but I never was so scared and never was more able to understand my Nina and to write her down as I was after I, I have entered my hotel, my protected place. <laughs> I think there is a scene when Nina describes this as uh, both the beginning of the world and the end of the world. Um, my, my last question to you, David, is, uh, is also about uh, Svalbard, because the theme of this year's Abuagora is water. And according to numerous mythological and religious cosmologies, water is the beginning of life. And in our days, water is also rapidly becoming the most contested uh, natural resources. And I want to show the audience a picture here on the overwhelming waters outside of uh, Koli Otok. Mm. Here it is. Oh, yeah. So, and I wonder, in your uh, novel, the stormy waters, uh, plants, seeds, uh, islands, darkness and light, all play important roles. Vera is on Goli Otok, almost fighting like a cosmic battle against the sun. And Nina, uh, on another island, is welcoming the sun in an almost religious ceremony. So I wonder if you can explain a little bit of the role of, of nature in this book. Like in every book of mine, even when it takes place within a city, uh, nature is very present. Uh, first of all, I love being in nature. Uh, we walk every day, my wife and I, we walk uh, for an hour between six and seven in the morning. We have a walk in the hills around our home, uh, in one of the suburbs of, of Jerusalem. And we see gazelles and we see foxes and shakals. Once we saw wolves, only once in all the 14 years that we are walking. And we found out that nature has this rare ability of comforting. Uh, and I remember when I was writing uh, the woman who escapes the news and she, she knows that the bad news about her son will reach her. Her son takes part in a war. And she knows that he would be killed. And she runs away from the bad, the bad notification. And she runs to the Galilee. The Galilee is, I think, one of the most place, beautiful places in Israel. By the way, the picture behind me, uh, painted by Alon Porat, describes a Galilee land view landscape. And we all the time say that it is as if in our home, there is a window to the Galilee. And, and uh, for writing this book, I myself walked, I walked more than 500 kilometers. And I describe in the book, all the vegetation and the flowers and the trees, and it gave me a feeling of solidity in a world that at the time was really shaken for me and broken and nothing was taken for granted anymore after we have lost our son. And I'll tell you one more thing. Uh, I, I met while walking, I met several people. Uh, and, and those people whom I met who did the same route, the Israeli route, like myself, uh, usually, they were people who did not agree totally with my political ideas, who is much more to the left than to the center or to the right. Did not agree with me politically. Many of them were living in settlements in the occupied territories. And if we met in any other place on earth, uh, I think immediately a discussion would have started, the political harsh discussions. The fact that we met in nature of this country, the fact that we both recognized our love to 
this plays to the vegetation, to the color of the land, sometimes to the air of a desert, even in the most uh, fruitful green places. Suddenly, I think we both understood something that we could not have understood otherwise, that we are only guests here, that we are temporary, and that we should treat with much more humility and modesty uh, the, the eternity of this earth. We are just guests here, as I said. Uh, and I, for me, this was such a strong experience, such a primal way of being in my country, in my land, uh, and without depriving others of, of this place. I, I remember in that book, uh, in Swedish, uh, um, there is a discussion when Ora, the main character, wonder what language nature is speaking. And uh, you're actually transcribing the, the, the voice of nature, the sounds of nature, um, which was very challenging also to, to try to put into Swedish. I worked together with the translator, Bo Kasselbo. You, you managed to translate it? Uh, we kept the guttural uh, Hebrew uh, Galilean voice, actually. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, so we wanted the nature to speak to sound Hebrew, in Hebrew, like, like it did that in your book. Uh, David, it's been wonderful to speak to you. Uh, I'm looking forward to the next translation workshop and I'm looking forward to us meeting also uh, in real life. In real life, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was a pleasure for me as well and I understand we are going to meet quite soon. So, ladies and gentlemen, this was a very rich conversation where one part was not cut out as we had planned, but I hope it didn't uh, matter too much. It's been fantastic to listen to all the themes that have uh, arisen already in this conversation, and we will now, uh, we will now um, contact, uh, or we both, I see we have both Natalie and David with us now, so Shalom David, welcome Natalie. Uh, hearing your words again, what we spoke about one week ago, I am sure this has arisen lots and lots of questions, both in our, our Zoom chat and in our audience here. So uh, is it okay for you if I just open up for questions at this point? Or is there something you want to reverse of what you said a week ago at this point? Do you hear me now? Do you hear me now? Yes. Natalie, you hear me? I hear you. Okay, hi, good to see you. Good to see you, David. So I'm ready for the questions. I am too. Have any no questions, questions at this, this point? point? You will unfortunately no, not be able to see, see the persons, persons uh, posing the questions. questions but you will hear them. Okay. Um, I think we will start with a very lengthy comment and question that has been posed to us in Zoom. So I will uh, now give the microphone to my colleague Anna who will read this question for you. And I think Natalie, if you have looked at the chat, you can see the question there as well. We will start with this question by Professor Hanna Meretoja. So I would like to ask how would you characterize your relationship to water 
and has it changed over time? I also want to confess that I am a huge fan of yours and, and I was hoping to meet you here in Finland and give you my book, The Ethics of Storytelling, Oxford University Press, 2018 in which I write about your work, the, uh, to the end of the land and falling out of time. In my book, I focus on the ethical potential of dialogical storytelling in your work and how, on how narratives can extend what I call <clears throat> our sense of possi possible. Today, you also talked about possibilities, for example, in connection to uh, the coronavirus crisis and how it could make us less confrontational and more dialogical. Also, what you said about the importance of families makes clear how fundamentally, dialogically and relationally you understand human existence. Could you comment on how you understand the dialogical dimension of our existence and uh, the potential of storytelling to strengthen our dialogical connectedness to one, uh, to one another and perhaps also our ability to do good, which you mentioned in your talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Hanna. I didn't get your surname, but Hanna, I guess, is good. Uh, again, uh, I'm glad to be here. I'm sorry I don't see the people in the place, in the hall. I have no idea how it looks like. Um, and, and yes, you, you, you are right. Uh, I think I'm a dialogical person. I think people change and develop through a dialogue. Uh, no man is an island. Uh, okay, but sometimes, well, maybe we are a peninsula. We are also lonely and in solitude and at the same time we need a lot of contact and we mature through contacts if only we are not hermetic if only we allow ourselves to open up in front of uh, other opinions other ways of being other habits other values uh, i i mentioned uh, this is i don't know what was left in the in in my recording but I, I spoke also about how uh, in my book, in, in, in my latest book that Natalie translated it, uh, the daughter, uh, Gilly, who hates her mother, really hates her, uh, in, in almost a childlike way or childish way. Uh, and then suddenly she feels that she cannot hate her anymore that something in the contact with her, in her misery, in her vulnerability, suddenly prevents Gilly from just hating her mother in a very hermetic way. And she asks herself, who am I without my hatred to Nina? And I think that so often we meet people whom their uh, backbone, mental backbone, is hatred or fear or bitterness or rage or suspicion. And they developed their personality around these black or dark uh, qualities. Uh, and they know very well how to be an enemy, but they don't know what does it mean to live your life either without an enemy or I say it, it sounds almost far-fetched for an Israeli to believe that it's possible, but let's, let's play a mental game. Who are we without our enemy? Who are we without our bitterness and fear and suspicion? Who are we without the seeds of poison that the military political conflict has infused into us? This is a question that I think Israelis and Palestinians should ask themselves uh, because both of us are so expert in being an enemy. We are so programmed to be an enemy and there are so many other layers of life, other nuances of life that we totally overlook because they don't fit to this state of mind of animosity, of permanent uh, suspicion and, and eternal fear. Uh, 
this is for the, the public political layer, but again, going back to the, the place of the individual, so many times all our personality is built around this entrenched muscle of the, of the mind, of the soul. And uh, it is so needed to soften it, to melt it, to make it move again. Uh, I, Natalie, I think I quoted this uh, poem of Yehuda Amichai, our great poet who died some years ago. And he said, even the feast, yes, the feast of the hand, once was an open hand with fingers. And this is where Yehuda Amichai went, wanted to get, and this is where I want to get. And I think every artist, actually is a dialogical person because he, be, he or she believes that what they say will be understood correctly, that there will be someone out there who will not denounce what they have to, to say, the story they have to tell. Uh, and I, I think that it gives me such pleasure, the very fact that now we are sitting and talking, me near Jerusalem in, in my home and you are in Turco in, in Hell City, in, in uh, Finland, uh, and, and to think that a story that I wrote in the, in the cellar of this home made its way throughout so much kilometers, swam over the sea and, and reached your heart. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's, it's a good feeling. So again, thank you for that. Natalie, would you like to add something to this from the translator's perspective about the dialogical? Because, of course, translating a work that is so um, closely tied to the language of Hebrew into another language and how then to make it communicate across these boundaries. As I have plunged through this book during the last week, I'm always thinking about how you were able, especially with Hebrew jokes, how you make them work and how you can make this dialogical process move on to other languages. I have a colleague of, of mine, uh, Anna, she calls the translation a miracle. It's, uh, there's a, a magical aspect to it um, because it is uh, impossible somehow. So it is a miracle when it happens. And I'd like to address this, this um, a very interesting question from, from the forum, because in this novel, what really fascinated me is that it is an extremely intimate uh, story. It's a very intimate narrative, uh, relational, but it is somehow sometimes told from the side. Um, David, you, uh, you write the story sometimes from the perspective of a film camera, the lens of a film camera, so this, the reader gets to see the story. Uh, and sometimes it's explained through hastily scribbled notes in a notebook. So it's also how we meet, we as readers meet the story, um, that it's sometimes filtrated through different media. And that, of course, brings another of, uh, perspective to this very human uh, situation in the very intimate family sphere. So I, I, I guess I'm curious about that to you, David, the, the choice of, of telling the story from different angles. Yes, but before that, Natalie, I, I will insist and ask you, how is it possible, translation? I know it's a huge question, but I write in Hebrew. My language is Hebrew. It's an ancient language that counts back 3,500 years, and it has so much meanings and nuances and residues and and i think so so often i write a sentence that echoes that the talmud or the bible itself because it's part of our daily talk the, the, the bible we even don't know sometimes that we are quoting the bible but we do and it, it takes place in the israeli jewish arena and the israeli jewish um, mentality and, and, and psychology and history and memory and identity. And you take this sentence and you have to transfer it and transform it to Swedish. Yeah. Uh, how is it possible? Because the words that you will be using will echo another melody, will ring another bell in the, in the mind and the heart of your reader. 
in Swedish, in Finnish, in Norwegian, in whatever. It is, it is another, uh, another uh, element of, of memories, of, uh, of identity. Absolutely, and also experiences, I think. And, and it's, I think it's even more difficult to translate it Hebrew into Swedish also because the, the secularity of our language that we so seldomly have, have um, biblical words or, or biblical quotes coming up, whereas in Israel, it's, it's part of the everyday language. When you go out and buy oranges, you will hear something from the Bible. Um, and um, I think that is mostly challenging and also very saddening. I can be extremely depressed if there's something, some nuance that I know that this will not resonate, this will not be heard in Swedish. I know that um, they, the readers will be deprived and uh, I of course try to work around that. Um, but I think, and also when I speak to my, my colleagues, I don't think it's an intellectual process. I, I think it's a very, um, it's, it's about instinct. I don't hear your stories in language. I don't hear them in Hebrew, really. I hear them on a deeper level, on a human level, and that is much more easy. I can work with the human drama uh, much more than an intellectual, um, when you put, when, when uh, thoughts and feelings and experiences are put into these uh, categories of language. Like you said, when the child starts to categorize that there's one word, or oh, for, for light, and it's a loss of all other words, all other nuances. I, I totally agree with you, with you, and I like this explanation very much because it really tells me something. Uh, and, and this is about the melody of literature. I always feel that literature is 90% melody, music. Uh, and, and I feel it, you know, I'll, I don't know if I ever told you, but I have this very strange way of writing. I write and rewrite and rewrite many, many versions. I'm talking about more than 20, 25 in the case of the book, The Woman Who Escaped the News. And I don't cut and paste. I really, you know, print it with my, my hands uh, because I, I realized that whenever I retold another, uh, I retold a certain uh, scene in the book, uh, and I did not just cut and paste it, but typed it, suddenly I understood some more nuances about it. Suddenly I could have enriched this, uh, this uh, picture that I described. And, and I remember when I was a very young uh, writer, I wrote a book called uh, The Smile of the Lamb, Lamb in B, with B in the end. And uh, I, I wrote it. And then I didn't know how I should write. I didn't know that I have a way, a theme, a paradigm, or whatever, a system. I just did it. And then I felt I need to rewrite it. And then I rewrote and rewrote. After the 12 version, I, I remember I came uh, to, to my wife and she was work, working here. And I told her, ah, I'm so relieved. I finished this version, number 12. And she gave me a look and she said, why are you so happy? Tomorrow you will start number 13, isn't it? And I said, yes, it is. Why is, the, why is it like that? So what, what we did is that we cut with scissors a certain paragraph, the same paragraph from all the, the versions, all the 12 versions that it had. And we sellotape them on the wall. And we went from one to number two, three, four, five, until then. Now, between the, the first one and the third one, the differences were huge. Then between the third and the sixth and the seventh, they started to shrink and they started to be minimal. And at a certain point, suddenly, I felt that I said what I wanted to say in the right tone. And that the musicality of this paragraph has been achieved totally. Why is it like that? I don't know. I just know now I have more confidence that the reader will hear in his or her inner ear what I wanted to say and how I wanted to say. And it reminds me that always the last version that I write, the last, last version that I write, 
I read it to myself out loud. I almost shout it. Uh, and, and you know that Gustave Flaubert, the, the great writer, used to stand in his window and shout with all his power, shout what he has written. And I, I'm much more merciful towards my neighbors. But still, I want to hear it out loud because when I read it out loud in the last version, all the remaining mistakes would surface. Suddenly it would be very clear why this, this word is needless, this exclamation mark is outrageous, that I over uh, described something or someone and did not allow the reader to, to imagine this character. But after this last version of reading out loud, then I feel everything is complete and then I can move to another part of the book. That's what the advice you give to us uh, during our workshops also, read out loud. Yes. Otherwise, you, we have, uh, we're quite free on how to deal with your jokes and, uh, and all that. But to read out loud, that's the advice that you really give us every time. Yeah, and I do it, yeah. Now, if there is anyone who would still like to pose a question, time flies really quickly when we have so much interesting things to talk about. And um, we have a question here in the auditorium, so we will now give the microphone here to a lady who will pose a question for you. Thank you. Um, I really liked it, um, how you described how nature um, prolongs uh, our lifespan or that um, like human-made boundaries and countries uh, have uh, are uh, will uh, will fade but uh, the earth is eternal or something like that maybe according to physics it might not be eternal but at least it lives a longer life and it may be difficult for humans to to uh, we are kind of short short sighted and then um, have difficulty in forgiving and there's like some really old conflicts that um, go from generation to the next and it's weird how people get born in in a certain area and then they identify with the um, conflict and nationality and all this but my question was that um, what is the relationship uh, with um, writing nature and spirituality because you mentioned the bible many times so that's my question thank you for for your question uh, writing nature and spirituality well i think writing has a lot to do with spirituality and as i explained before with nature because of both can liberate us, can make us see things differently, uh, allow us to demilitarize ourselves, both nature, spirituality, and writing. Uh, and I spoke before, uh, a week ago, when, when Natalie uh, recorded me and, and Ruth, uh, I, I spoke about uh, how writing has the ability to, to allow us to be different, to try not to block ourselves from any other. Uh, I feel so much the temptation to be entrenched, to be closed because it protects me and it prevents me from exposing myself to uh, some hurts and some insults. But actually, my wish from writing is just the opposite. You know, I want, I want to be heard, and I want to stand almost, you know, naked in front of what there is to stand 
in front. Uh, and and I, as I said, I don't want to be protected. And the writing is a wonderful way of being not protected. Uh, because uh, suddenly it shows us how much we are consist of many others, even others that some maybe we do not like or do not understand, or how much every one of us, you know, every man has the option of the woman he could have been inside him. If you look at the face of every person you know, you can see how he or she could have belonged to the other gender. Uh, every, every, in every old man, there is still maybe, hopefully, the little child or the little baby he was. In every baby that is born, you can see at the very first moments, they have faces of old people almost. In every sane, normal person, you can trace, if you look deep, you can trace the abnormal, the insane. Uh, in a more practical way, in every Israeli, you can see how he would have acted and lived and experienced his life had he been a Palestinian and vice versa. So writing allows us to bring all those optional others from ourselves, to bring it out, to, to look at them, to acknowledge them, to benefit, to enjoy them, to feel the, the diversity of our being, which is endless, really endless. We, we narrow down, we, we congeal after a certain age because we need to function, of course, this terrible world. We have to function. And, and we, we educate our children from the age of one, you know, to start to, to do things quicker and quicker. And when they are three and still don't know how to tie their shoelaces, we, we become angry and, and we all the time rush them because it's this war between the com war conflict between the community of the grown-ups and the community of children yes the need of the grown-ups to socialize the children and to make them a, 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 an effective part of, of life which is terrible i think but all, all that is is are things that block us from experience experiencing the wealth of being and, and the joy of being uh, and the depth of being. And I, I really, for me, writing is the best way I know, yeah, the best way I know to explore all these options of mine that I don't dare or don't know how to explore otherwise. And to, to allow myself you know, to be with the capital B to be all the options that are suggested to me. And of course, I mean, life is very short, outrageously short, and I will not be able to write all the books I would love to write. But in, in the few books that I've written, I, the, the fuel that fed me and, and pushed me ahead was this desire to, to be as much as possible to be in the inner life of another uh, human being. And just to conclude, this is very much true for spirituality, for every spiritual uh, behavior. Nature can enable it. I think this is a wonderful and beautiful note to end this conversation on. I think we would have talked for a long time on all the rich aspects that come out of this discussion. And I hope you can all now go to read the book. It should be out in Finnish also rather soon. And at this point, I think we should now say a wonderful great thank you to David Grossman, Toda Raba, Natalie Lantz, Tuusen Tak, and we give you a warm round of applause. Thank you. Now, for those of you following us in Zoom, we will have a short break now on 10 minutes, after which we will have the closing ceremony of Abu Agora. So please stretch your legs and we will meet again in 10 minutes. <laughs>